All right, so we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Mark this morning. We are not really getting a whole lot into the text. We are going to be just getting some background from Mark's Gospel account. Um, when you're looking at Mark's Gospel account, uh, it's, it's, it's a Gospel account that focuses on service and on action. That's what we're going to see a lot of in Mark's Gospel account and really what we're going to be, be focusing in on. So let's start here. Uh, who was Mark? Any ideas? Who? There's, there's a possibility that there's some connection, there's some familiar connection with Barnabas. Most likely a Jew. John Mark, yes. John Mark. He is Mark, also called John, and so we usually just put it all together and call him John Mark. Companion of Paul, Companion of Paul on a missionary journey, and then kind of butted, or, or he and Paul had a falling out uh, before the second missionary journey. Everything gets, gets smoothed over, and as Paul is at the end of his life, he has a, a very fond appreciation for Mark. That's right. Uh, jump over to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 is going to give us a little bit of information here. Acts chapter 12. This is one of the times where Peter is in prison, and one of the times where he is miraculously uh, let out of prison. And after he is led out of prison by an angel in verse 10, when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So in verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So as soon as Peter is sprung out of prison, where does he go? Okay, he's going to the house of Mary, and Mary happens to be the mother of John Mark. Now, uh, just like we can have multiple people having the same name in, in, in the church here, right? We've got two Deborahs, for example. Um, you have multiple people in the New Testament by the name of, well, yes, John, but in chapter 12, verse 12, multiple women by the name of Mary. That's right. You've got Mary, the, the mother of John Mark. You've got Mary, the mother of Jesus. You've got Mary Magdalene. Okay, so you've got uh, a number of them, and that really is going to help explain Later in the gospel accounts where you see multiple Marys at different times seeing Jesus or going to the tomb. And what explains that is you have multiple people who were named Mary. So this is all taking place in what city? Take a shot in the dark even though we haven't read it yet. Yeah, where does a lot of this stuff take place? Jerusalem, that's right. Okay. So um, you remember after the persecution that arose with Stephen... You've got folks leaving Jerusalem, but it's noted that who stayed behind in Jerusalem? What group of people? The apostles did. Okay, And so here in Acts chapter 12, here is Peter who has uh, stayed behind for the most part in Jerusalem. And that's going to be uh, seemingly consistent throughout the New Testament until he's going to end up in Rome. And who has a home here in Jerusalem? Well, Mary, the mother of John Mark. And as soon as Peter busts out of prison, where does he go? Mary's house, which may begin to tell us of a relationship between Peter and John Mark's family, right? Um, if you're busting out of prison, where are you going? You're go somewhere safe, somewhere where family is, somewhere familiar, right? And that uh, certainly seems to be... What Or the woods, but Peter doesn't go to the woods, Corey. So in chapter 12 and verse 25, 
Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was called Mark. So he is with Paul and Barnabas on, uh, on a preaching journey. Uh, but at the end of Acts chapter 15, this is where we find Paul and Barnabas having a falling out because Barnabas wants to bring John Mark on the second missionary journey. Paul says absolutely not because he feels like John Mark abandoned them at one point. Um, as, as Jody mentioned, this is all going to get resolved uh, later on. But Paul, or rather Barnabas and Mark, seem to have traveled and preached the gospel um, uh, separately than, than Paul and his companions. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, flip over there just real quick. Paul is going to note uh, that he now finds John Mark useful. This is at the end of, of his life. Verse 11 of chapter 4, 2 Timothy, Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. So that's just kind of a, uh, just a brief rundown and overview of the life of Mark. Now, here's a question I have for you. In all of the things we have said about John Mark, what is he not? He's not an apostle, right? John Mark is not an apostle. But Matthew was an apostle. John is an apostle. So if Mark was not an apostle, how can we trust his gospel account? Okay, so we've got this idea first, that there's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who is guiding the various authors of Scripture, whether they were apostles or not. You're there in 2 Timothy, go a few pages later, to uh, 2 Peter. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Peter says, Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All right. So is the Holy Spirit's inspiration of, of writers and prophets limited to just the apostles? The answer is no. Okay, so it's, it's open to, to many more than that, um, especially when we consider what body of the Bible? Yeah, the entire Old Testament. You've got Moses, you've got Isaiah, Jeremiah. All of them were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but none of them were, were apostles, right? Okay. Look at Mark chapter 14. What would be the benefit of being an apostle when you're writing a gospel account? Think of that while you're flipping over to Mark 14. Why would it be beneficial if you're writing a gospel account to actually have been an apostle? You had first-hand experience with Jesus, right? In order to qualify as an apostle, what did you have to be? An eyewitness of Jesus, right? Specifically of the resurrected Christ. Um, but with Mark, he's not an apostle. Okay? Were there other witnesses of Jesus who were not apostles? Yes, so Mark can possibly fall into that category. Okay? But do, do Matthew, Mark, do, do Matthew, Luke, or John ever mention any association between Jesus and Mark? Take a wild guess. No. no. Uh, in the book of Acts, do we see any association with Mark and Jesus? No, because the only time you're really going to have a chance to have an association with Jesus is there in Acts chapter 1. But who's he with? Peter. He's with the apostles. That's right. Okay, But look at Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 and verse 51. Here is Jesus. He has been betrayed. All of the apostles have fled him. But in verse 51, there is somebody who's following behind. And here's all we know. There was a certain young man who was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they seized him, but he left the linen sheet behind and escaped naked. Now, weird little addition there, right? Little 
naked boy running away from this, you know, arrest scene. Why well, say little boy? Okay, you've got young man there. Uh, you do a little bit of background work on customs at this time. Guess what children normally slept in in this time period? Just a, a little linen sheet like that. No, no special, you know, Superman pajamas or anything like this, right? You had a linen sheet. Who's the only person that mentions this young man? Mark is the only gospel writer who records this. And the, the supposition by most people is that why does Mark include this story? Because it's him. Because it's him. That's, that's the thought of, of many scholars, that when you're reading Mark 14, 51, and you get this story of this young man running away naked after, after his linen uh, garment has been seized, it's probably Mark writing about himself, just not using his name. Um, that's, that's not unorthodox to record a story and not... not uh, record your name. Mark's not out to promote himself. He's keeping the attention focused where? On Jesus. So why, why bring himself up and make himself the focus? So Mark does apparently have first-hand experience with Jesus. And indeed, if his family is living there in Jerusalem, and there is this relationship there, is it possible Jesus goes and goes to John Mark's house at some point? One of these Marys? Is it possible one of these Marys that Jesus has so much interaction with is John Mark's mother? Absolutely, it's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. So, come over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Very end of Peter's gospel account. And who has a very close relationship with Peter? Mark. In fact, Peter goes so far as to call Mark what? His son. Okay. You've got a very, very close association here between Mark and the Apostle Peter. Um, so we see it here in 1 Peter chapter 5. We're seeing it back in Acts chapter 12. Guess who Mark's gospel account focuses on besides Jesus more than anybody else? Peter. Peter. All of that taken then, then leads most people to this conclusion, and I think it's a correct conclusion um, to arrive at, that Mark isn't so much recording his own gospel narrative concerning his interactions with Jesus, but rather whose? Peter's. And that generally does seem to be a consensus that when you're reading Mark's gospel account, you're reading Peter's gospel account that, that Mark has written down because Mark had this close association with Peter. Uh, the same thing goes for the gospel of Luke. Was Luke an apostle? Nope. But who is he closely associated with? Paul. And so Luke's gospel account relates very nicely with, with the life of Paul, especially when you consider that the gospel of Luke was sent around with what other book of the New Testament? The book of Acts. That's right. We'll notice that here in just a moment. And that becomes significant because the Holy Spirit promised to inspire the apostles specifically. That's not to say that the Holy Spirit is not inspiring anyone else at this time. Mark, Luke, going back, David, Moses, Isaiah, others. But it is to say there was a specific way in which the Holy Spirit was guiding the apostles. Uh, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, John chapter 16, he will guide you into all truth, right? And that was the promise that was made there to the apostles. So here's a question. When did, when did Mark write his gospel account? Why would it matter? 
Why would it matter? If it's not written somewhere around the time of events, then, then it's not trustworthy. Okay. Why else? That is up for debate, but Jeff, I tend to think so. I think Mark is the first gospel account that is written. I think you're right. Um, think about this. If, if, if Jeff is not writing about the floodplains and the dams in Mississippi, but instead Jeff is writing about uh, the American political scene, is 18th century Jeff going to be writing differently and having a different perspective on things than 21st century Jeff? Yeah, right? The, the climate, the, the political climate, the socioeconomic climate is different, right? Depending on when something is written, it's going to reflect more of the time and kind of be reflective of the times, right? So it's thought that Mark is, is the earliest gospel. Can I, I want to show you a few things. This graph looks intimidating. This is a really, really cool, really, really cool infographic here. Let me break it down for you. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These gospel accounts are sometimes called the what? The what? The synoptic gospels, that's right. Synoptic gospels literally translated means one eye. Let me get out of the picture here. One eye. That is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have kind of a singular focus and perspective on the gospel account that they are writing versus John. John is completely different, right? And we pointed that out, I think, last week or the week before. All right. So what this graph is communicating is similarities and differences just in the text of the gospel accounts, okay? When you see triple tradition... Okay? That is information that is, that is recorded in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? Uh, then you see what's called double tradition down here at the bottom, right? Double tradition. And that is information that is recorded in two of the synoptic Gospels. Okay? And then you've got here in aqua and over here in green and up here in brown material that is unique to each gospel account. What do you notice, for example, about Luke and Matthew? You've got, yeah, you've got some, some tradition, about a quarter of similarity there. And then what else? Quite a bit of unique material, right, between Matthew and Luke. But when you come up here to Mark, how much unique material do you have? Three <laughs> percent, right? Three uh, percent. If I'm remembering correctly, Mark has approximately 660 verses in it. Okay? So if you're talking unique, three percent, let's, let's just call it, 700 verses, then you've got three unique verses in every 100, so that's going to give you 21 unique verses in Mark. A very unique gospel account? No. Okay. So, the relative ununiqueness, the gospel writers can make up words sometimes, so can I, ununiqueness. The relative ununiqueness of Mark lends to the idea that Mark is the first gospel account and that the other synoptic gospels fill in more of the story why would it make sense just looking at this that mark would be the first gospel account he has no reference to the other he's not going to be making reference to other books that are already written because they're not there yet there's no other book to refer to jeff what were you thinking Uh huh. There are different audiences uh, that there's different material that will appeal to them. And I think that's a big point here. Mark, as we're going to see, is writing um, to a specific audience. 
are, are Matthew's audience and Luke's audience going to be the same as Mark's audience? No, they're not. And we're going to be able to demonstrate that, I think, pretty clearly as, as we get into the text here. Um, but just, just kind of keep that in mind that Mark does not have a whole lot of unique material in it. That would make sense if he's the first gospel account. And that the other gospel writers are writing longer gospel accounts. And the Holy Spirit is, is revealing more information as it relates to the different audiences that are there. And filling in more of the, more of the story. All right. Jeff. Okay, John Mark or Apostle John? Okay. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. There may be something there, Jeff. There may be something there. I think you might be onto something. Um, note this as well. When, when the Gospel of Luke is sent out, it's sent out in connection with what other New Testament book? Acts. So if Mark is the first Gospel account, it not only comes before Luke and Matthew, it also comes before, comes before Acts. That's right. Acts, you can, you can pretty conclusively date the, the book of Acts somewhere around 60 to 62 A.D. Or A.D. 60 to 62. So, the Gospel of Mark is going to be coming just somewhere slightly prior to that. When you talk about the unique material in Mark, material that is found in Mark that is not found in, in other Gospel accounts, right? Uh, you've got the parable of automatic growth. Farmer plants a seed, comes out the next morning, and guess what? It's all grown up. All right? Mark, only, Mark is the only gospel writer to record that. There's the healing of the deaf and mute man. Mark is the only one who records that. There's the blind man at Bethsaida who is healed. Mark is the only gospel writer to record that. Uh, you've got the condition on forgiveness that in order to be forgiving, or in order to be forgiven, what do you yourself have to be? I just gave it away to you. Forgiving, yes. Uh, Mark is the only one of the gospel writers to, to record that. Uh, the young man fleeing naked, we talked about that from chapter 14. And then elements of the Great Commission that Mark records, uh, certain elements are only found in Mark's gospel account. Okay, So you've got really these six episodes here that are unique in some way, shape, or form to Mark that are not found in the other gospel accounts. Uh, whereas when you go to Matthew or Luke and you look at material that is unique to them like we have in our prior uh, sermons, there's a lot more there. A lot more there. Uh, yes? I've got a question. Okay. Mark is unique because it's not like you said. It is the book of Acts. Yeah. It's used for uh, choice of words. Hold on. Don't get into that yet. Okay. Okay. Did you have anything else you wanted to say or were no, you just going to yeah. reveal that? Okay. <laughs> Hold on to that. All right. So... Uh, many are going to date the book from the mid-50s to the early 60s. So what's going on in the mid-50s or early 60s? Don't say rock and roll and Kent State and stuff like that. Well, persecution of the church. Okay. By whom, Tracy? By the, uh, hip, by the, by the Romans. By the Romans, that's right. You want to fill in any more there? Nero. Nero. Okay. Anyone else? Clint? Sam? No? Missionary journeys. Missionary journeys. Very good. All right. Y'all ever met Suetonius? Me and, him, me and him, we real tight. Got this photo of him. Selfie. Here's what Suetonius had to say in uh, Lives of the Twelve Caesars. Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he, that is Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Who is Crestus? A Jew. A Jew? Christ. But Clint. Not very 
Suetonius didn't say Crestus. Didn't say Christ. He said Crestus. Why would Suetonius say Crestus? Okay, You're, you've got a, a Greek and a Latin component there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. If you, if you're willing to answer this. If you were born before 1955, raise your hand, if you're willing to admit that. Be proud, right? I'm not, but, okay? All right. When we talk about the Middle East today, what's the predominant religion of the Middle East? Muslim is not a religion. Islam. Okay, Islam, thank you. Yes. What is Muslim? Oh, that's the people. People. Not the religion itself. The religion is called Islam. But here's the point I want to make. Before, if you were raised prior to 1955, you probably didn't call it Islam. What was it called? Starts with an M, but not Muslim. Mohammedism. 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 Did you ever hear Islam called Mohammedism? Okay. Uh, there are some, yeah, of course you didn't hear it. <laughs> and I'm because, like me, you're young. We never heard it called that. Uh, you can actually go back. Uh, there was a debate in either Nashville or Huntsville back in the 60s or 70s. And it was between an Islamic scholar and a preacher in the Churches of Christ. And throughout the debate, and it, when it wasn't seen as, as a stigma, this is just how it was known at the time. It was the debate on Mohammedism. All right. Now, it's not called Mohammedism anymore, but we get the point, right? Sometimes names change because of unfamiliarity, right? Same kind of thing here. Is Suetonius a follower of Jesus? Let me give you the answer. No, he's not, okay? But he is a historian recording what went on, okay? Is it possible that sometimes when you're just hearing about things that happened, that you're going to record a name a little bit differently than how it actually appears. Goodness, when I go over to Columbia and preach, I'm called all sorts of other names besides Tyler because it's so difficult for the Hispanic tongue to pronounce Tyler. I don't know how many times I've been called Taylor. In fact, uh, two weeks ago when I was sitting in on the Bible study, we have Brother Taylor with us. Well, who's that? Same kind of thing here with Crestus and Christ. Who is Suetonius writing about? People who followed Crestus, people who followed Christ, okay? Um, can you think of something this lines up with in Scripture? Acts chapter 18, verse 2. Why were, um, not Ananias and Sapphira, why were Aquila and Priscilla out of Jerusalem? Out of or out of Rome? They, out of Rome. they had been expelled from Rome. Acts chapter 18 and verse 2. What had Claudius done? He found, this is Paul, found certain Jews named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy. What cities in Italy? Rome. With his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave from Rome. Well, all Claudius did was tell all the Jews to get out of Rome. He didn't say anything about the Christians. But how did Rome view Christianity? A sect of Judaism, right? It was viewed as a sect of Judaism. And so when they kicked the, the Jews out of Rome, that included whom? That included the Christians, that's right. Uh, that happens around 52, or A.D. 52, somewhere around in there. And then you've got this. And this is what Tracy was referring to. Suetonius later in Lives of the Twelve Caesars. Uh, and talking about Nero, punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men giving to a new and mischievous superstition. All right. That new and mischievous superstition was following a, an itinerant Jewish preacher who they claimed had died and raised from the dead. Right? And you can read about some other 1st, um, 2nd, 3rd century historians who record things very, very similar to Suetonius here. Uh, the point simply being, uh, under the reign of Claudius, what was happening to Christians? Persecution, hardship. And then into the reign of Nero, you have even more persecution, right? 
That happens approximately A.D. 64. So, when you come back to the book of Mark, guess what one of the emphasis is? Emphasis? Emphases. Guess what Mark emphasizes in his gospel account? How about that? He's going to remind his audience to endure what? Hardship, persecution, and suffering. Why would that be a message that Mark would focus on that maybe Matthew and Luke don't? Because that's what was happening. That's what was happening. Especially when we're going to consider the audience to whom Mark is writing. So the beginnings of a persecution against Christians, particularly around Rome, fits the context of Mark nicely. Look at these three passages with me. Come over to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We've got about five minutes left. Let's see what we can fly through here. Mark 8, verse 31. He began to teach them and tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He was stating the matter plainly. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Peter said, or the Lord says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Verse 34. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. Verse 38, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Verse 36, what does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 29, Mark 10, 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the Gospels, verse 30, but that he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. And then look at chapter 13. These are just three examples here, but Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. This is um, Mark's recording of, of the Olivet Discourse. What wonderful buildings, verse 1. Jesus said to them, verse 2, all of these stones will be torn down. Verse 5, Jesus began saying to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he will mislead many, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Verse 9, be on guard, for they will deliver you up to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Verse 11, when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 13. You will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So do we see Mark writing in a context of persecution and preparing his audience for hardships that would come? These three passages, and then more that we'll note in the book, yes. So... Here is your assignment for next week. Okay? Now I'll also take a copy of this slide and, and give it to Cody so that when we send out our, our email this afternoon, it'll be on there so you don't have to sit there and scribble down all the questions. But here they are. Five questions for next week. Number one, and if you know this already, do not shout it out in class right now. Okay? Number one, what word does Mark use frequently throughout his gospel account? For example... Book of Ecclesiastes, Nineveh. What's our repeated phrase in Ecclesiastes? Do you remember? Vanity of vanity, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. That's right. Okay. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, that somebody made reference to this morning. 1 Corinthians, what was our dividing phrase in 1 Corinthians? Do you remember? I'm going to go back and teach all 18 months of 1 Corinthians again if you don't get this right. Now concerning, remember? Now concerning, Paul says that I think six times there. Okay, 
So what word does Mark use frequently? Uh, what does Mark's use of that word communicate about his gospel account? That's what I want you to think about too. Number three. I want you to find when Jerusalem is first mentioned in Mark's gospel account. Find when Jerusalem is first mentioned in Mark's gospel account. Number four. Find when the temple is first mentioned in Mark's gospel account. And then number five, what might the answers to questions three and four reveal to us about Mark's gospel account? Okay? Those are your assignments for next week. Okay. Yes, Clint. Uh huh. Now, they could be called, most of the Christians could still be called Jews because of their ethnic origin. Yeah, absolutely. You could be a Jewish Christian that's a Christian mm -hmm. that's not practicing Judaism, but is. But they're still going to call you a Jew, that's right? Yes, sir. I think that's a good point. And then, what I want you to do, read chapter one for next week. All right? Questions, comments, gripes, complaints, concerns? critiques clear as mud all right appreciate it guys they will be dismissing the class